again, we're going to take some time to read, to meditate, to ponder, to learn uh, you know, the scriptures. And that is a wonderful discipline that you know, we want to cultivate deeply. Okay, so reading the epistles at Sunday school, this is what it means to meditate or contemplate. Not just to read through, okay, I've understood it, but to go back to the principles of, again, and then let's think deeper. Let's read it again. Let's uh, ponder it through. How does it work? Okay, well, we're going to take a look uh, at over here, uh, chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians, chapter 8, where Paul writes, and he actually writes quite a bit on this subject of giving. Okay, well, we're going to begin with a word of prayer, and then we're going to take a look at uh, this, uh, this morning's study at Sunday School uh, in 2 Corinthians, chapter 8. Okay, well, let's begin in prayer together. Our Father, we thank you for keeping us over another week. Help us to treasure always your grace, your mercy, and never to take for granted the life that you've given to us. Help us to look at how we can live this life as meaningful as we can. We ask that you would enlighten us as we read the Scriptures. Guide us, give to us the wisdom to develop and practice our faith well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we come to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and 8 and 9 actually, uh, two chapters where Paul will uh, teach and encourage and actually advise the Corinthians to cultivate uh, this you know, the, the giving See, giving is something that needs to be learned. This was taught by Moses. Giving as an offering to God. Giving to care for people. And Israel uh, was actually instructed on these things. You read Deuteronomy, we read it in Leviticus. So very much, this is what it means to be God's people. Right? Right? And, and so these principles have actually always been there. This is not just Paul's. Was this taught by the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes. He's the one, who, uh, you know, you know, Paul would later recall this. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And so this is something that the, the apostles taught, taught the churches. Right? They were those who cultivated very well the, the Philippian church. And they were those who need uh, further instructions. But this is actually a valid uh, biblical teaching. Now, please don't be mistaken. This is not about fundraising. It is not about fundraising. The teaching on giving is not quite the same as, okay, this is just a way of raising funds. Just like the world, it isn't. We would be mistaken if we just draw that comparison just like that. Okay, so let's, we're going to take a look at it. What was, what was it, what is this all about? How, what, what is it to mean to give and how to give? Right, we teach, I, well, I teach my children that we'll, you know, from young, we teach them to give, we teach them to share. Otherwise, they are not going to, right, from a very young age. Now, for ourselves, how do we understand this in the context of our faith, in the context of, you know, of, of, of life? Okay? And so in chapter 8, quick recap, Paul brings up the Macedonians' uh, churches to encourage the Corinthians and said how they gave out, even out of their deep poverty. They gave the riches of their liberality. And then he says, I bear witness, in verse 3, uh, yep, their ability, beyond their ability, uh, freely willing. Right? And this was them. They gave out of joy. They gave, gave out of fellowship, as we read later. They gave, gave out of love, and, and so and so forth. 
uh, you know, they first gave themselves to the Lord. This is the basis of why they did it. See, we think about people who give, and we always think, okay, the rich, only they can give. You know, the, the, the Bill Gates, the Warren Buffetts, the, the, all the others that has the funds to give and to really make a difference. Say, wow, how fast, what's the point? We're not going to make a big difference. And so, so that sort of turned us off. It shouldn't, right? So it's quite different. It, it's not, the Macedonians were not wealthy, rich people. They were average people. They were people who were going through hard times too. But they cultivated a wonderful heart and spirit of giving, of caring, which uh, Paul uh, highlighted as wonderful examples over here. And then, of course, he gave uh, the greatest example, and that's Jesus, isn't it? And so he brings up the Lord Jesus Christ as the example of one uh, who gave. Though he was rich, we read in verse 9, yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty may become rich. Right? That's where we left off last week. And then we continue in verse 10, and then he says, and in this I give advice. Now, this is very much a pastoral advice. Right? So that's what, what does pastors do? Well, the work of shepherding, the work of preaching, the work of uh, teaching, the work of counseling, and he add one more, advice. Right? So this was uh, advising to distinguish that in verse 8, he is not speaking out of, this is commandment of the Lord. But is it an advice any less? Of course not. That depends who gives the advice, right? So this is a advice that comes from an apostle of Christ, Paul. This is an advice from uh, their pastor who loves them deeply, Paul. He loved the Corinthian church and he had expressed that on many occasions, right? And so he says to them, I advise you, I give, you, I give advice it is to your advantage. That's what a pastoral advice is. You give advice that would really be a benefit, that would profit your faith, that would really, you know, this with understanding here, that it would uh, enrich your heart, your spirit, your soul, and more. Hence, the advice given. Right? Right? So this was a wonderful uh, uh, understanding of this, to see this advice given. Now, an advice is an advice. You can choose to take it or you can choose not to take it. Up to you, isn't it? Right? There is no threat behind it. There is no, it's an advice. If you heed this advice, well, like he says, to your advantage it will be to your advantage, right? It would uh, do good to them and, and the Lord's blessings, right? So this is, uh, what is this advice? Okay, now let's take a look at uh, closer at the advice that was actually given to them, okay? And then he says, uh, it is to your advantage not only to be doing what you began and were desiring to a year ago. But now you also must complete the doing of it. That as there was a readiness uh, you know, to desire it, so there also may be a completion out of what you have. There is, this is something that uh, puts it into perspective, into context, what this advice was. So this is not a general advice, right? 
They are advice that are general advice. What's a general advice? A general advice, you know, you know you, we, should, we should walk with the Lord. We really should walk with the Lord. It's a good advice, but it's general, right? We should address our sins. We should bring them to the Lord. We should repent. We should be restored back to God. They're good advice, but it is a general advice. This, those advice would apply to all the churches, everybody, in fact. Now, this is specific advice. It would tell us of the relationship Paul had with the church. You can only give very specific advice if you know the person. If you know, um, you know what, what are the areas that need advising, that need improving, that needs to be done. We cannot advise anything if you know very little. Except you can only give general advice. Right? So this is a very specific now, what was the thing here? You see, the Corinthians began. They, they, this was a year ago. They, they, they were ready. They were prepared. They wanted to give. So they were doing well. But then along the way, this was stalled. They stopped. Right? Well, we don't know exactly what stalled it, but we can kind of guess from... 1 Corinthians, the church became divided, the church, they were contending against each other, and the church was really weakened by the problems that they were going through. See, where they were once united in heart and mind and spirit, let's go help the other churches. Let's do that. That was a year ago. They started actually preparing for this, planning for this. And along the way, the false people came in. There were false teachers. There were false brethren. And then the problems rise up and no longer united. They were very divided. Why, why do we want to give towards this? Why should we support this? Why should we do that? And so this was actually stalled. It happens. It happens everywhere. Right? One, let's do this. The other side says, no. Why do we want to do that? Why do we want to spend money on that? Right? Well, there is a story of how a church was divided and split at the end. Over, would you believe it, a potato peeling machine. One group says we should invest in a potato peeling machine because it you know, speeds up the work of cooking. The other group says no. Why do we want to invest in it? It's too much money, plus we like to chit-chat and peel potato. And so one yes, one no, one yes, one no. And sadly, that church actually split. It's painful that it can go that way. Right? So we see the problems if, of, of this in 1 Corinthians. And Paul wrote to them. Of course, this was not over potato peeler. This was over sin. This was over doctrine. This was over very, very serious matter, sexual immorality in the church. And Paul had to write very, very firmly to the church in 1 Corinthians. Now, in 2 Corinthians, we see there was repentance, there was restoration, Titus was there, right? To minister to them, and they were restored to the Lord. And now, this next part, Paul brings it up. Now, this began a year ago, it is stalled. Now he says to them, I advise you, complete it. Complete it. Complete what you began a year ago. Right? So this is where we are at. 
the restoration, the repentance, restoration, the, all right? Now, the word is there, complete, that you complete this grace that is there. And then he says it again, you must complete doing, uh, doing this, but now you also must complete the doing of it. There was readiness, desire, now, that there may also be completion of what you have. Okay, so this was the advice. Now, the, the next part of it is it's important uh, to see. Okay, in verse 12. And in verse 12, we read, For if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to, one, uh, to what one has and not according to what he does not have. Right? Now, verse 13, let's just read the whole thing and then uh, we, we put it together. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you be burdened, but by uh, an equality that now at this time your abundance may supply their lack and their abundance also may supply your lack, that there may be equality. As it is written, he who has gathered much had nothing left, and he who gathered little uh, had no lack. Now, remember, even as, as Paul gives an advice, this advice actually comes from the Scriptures. This advice comes from teaching. It is not just my opinion. This is what I think. It's more than an opinion. It is his personal opinion. But it, this opinion comes from the, the, the understanding of the Scriptures, knowledge of the Scriptures, wisdom, experience, and more. Paul and he teach them, right? So, under this is the advice, okay? So, carefully explain. So, let there be no misunderstanding about this. Now, first thing that we want to look at. Remember? Okay, here's the advice, encouragement, finish. That you desire to do this, this is a good desire. Now, the key word here is acceptance. Right? Now, let's go back a little bit um, and, and, and see this. For if there is first a willing mind, it is uh, accepted. So in Paul's mind and heart, what is the most important thing about learning to give what is acceptable in God's sight. What is acceptable in God's sight? And this was something that actually Jesus taught His disciples. As Paul now is teaching the Corinthians. And this, was an imp this is actually a very, very important lesson to learn. Okay, let's take a look at how the Lord Jesus taught His disciples what to look out for. Okay, right now, remember the story of the woman who gave two mites. Right now, let's, let's take a look at that. It's actually recorded in two Gospels, the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Luke. And they're both very similar. So let's turn to Luke's Gospel in Luke 21, to take a look at uh, what Jesus taught His disciples concerning giving. Okay, now, in Luke's Gospel, we read in chapter 21. Now, chapter, see, um, when the Gospels were written, they were not written in chapters. 
right? Yeah, this came later by translators and all for easier referencing. So we must look at the gospel as in the one whole thing. They're all connected. Actually, the last part of chapter uh, 20 and 21, should, actually 20, 21 should be part of the same thing. Take a look at just 20 and the last part of it where we read uh, how Jesus spoke to His disciples and cautioned them. Beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes, love greetings in marketplaces, the best seat in the synagogues, and the best places at the feast. <laughs> Watch out. Don't be impressed with things like that. Okay, today, this is called VIP. I have a VIP room. I have a VIP, you know, whatever, treatment. And it can end up even in the practice of religion. See, much of the world's ways can actually spill over. Where did they get these practice from? These were scribes. These were people who were meant to be, uh, you know, teachers of the... And what do they end up loving more than anything? Greetings in the marketplaces. They like the best seat in the synagogue, the best seat of the feast. And, right, well, some of them, you know, you get invited to all the feasts, the best place, closest to the food. And then, uh, who devour widows in houses, and there we, it, here's a real big problem. Okay? They make long prayers, they will receive greater condemnation. Watch out for hypocrisy. Now, that's a real danger there. Now, then he looked up. See, the connection and verse, chapter 21, verse 1. This is actually a continuation of what Jesus was saying to His disciples. And He looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And He saw also a certain poor widow putting in two mites. <sighs> what is two mites? See, um, one mite, it is like a small copper coin. This is the smallest denomination in their money. Okay? Today's equivalent would be maybe one quarter of a cent. That's really, really small. Right? In, in India, they, their currency is rupees. Right? And, and there is one rupee. One rupee is, okay, uh, one dollar, one Aussie dollar is equivalent to 50 rupees. Okay, so you just convert that, about thereabouts, right? 50 rupees. Now, there is one, what can you get with one rupee? Actually, a cup of tea. And they will take the cup of tea and drink it. Right? Now, there are people, uh, this, is an, this is real. The birds tell you, this is real. In India, the, the people come and they are widows. They are very hard lives and they are very, very difficult circumstances. And there are people who literally give one rupee. Is this accepted? And to the Lord, yes. Now, watch, watch this, how, what Jesus said. He said to them, Truly I say to you, that this poor widow has put in more than all. Given her circumstance, given what she has, and we read, for all these out of the abundance they have put in their offerings for God. And then we read 
but she out of her poverty put in all the livelihood that she had. Now that was an important thing for the disciples to learn. What do you look for? Now one day they will be the apostles. Look for acceptance from God. What will the Lord see? You see though, see, we think, okay, this person, this very wealthy man can give a lot. Well, they can, they can give a lot because they're very, very wealthy. It's, to them, it's nothing. They give out of their abundance. But this lady, this widow, out of her poverty, out of her livelihood, she only, this is all she has. See, what difference is two mites going to make? Don't think about difference. Think. This offering is going to God. And Jesus said she has given more. That was something for them to really learn. Learn acceptance. What would the Lord accept? Now, if the, if the rich gave two mites, that is going to be a big problem. If those who have, and then they go, okay, I'm going to give my two mites, that, of course, is a zero. But this one, given what, who she is, what she has, she gave, we read, all the livelihood that she had. And Jesus tells the disciples, this woman has given more than those who are wealthy. So quite different from how giving is understood in the world. Right? The wealthy give, wow, they have given so much more. They have given more. Who has given more? Depending on the dollars and the cents. But to God, it's a bit different. It is not out of the abundance, okay, we can just do this easily. But out of faith, out of carefully thinking through, out of you really, why would she want to do this? Now, it's not mentioned, actually, is it? Nothing else is mentioned here. La later on, uh, you know, the apostles will explain some of these things, and Paul did explain it. What is it, what is God, what will God accept? Actually, this is mentioned a lot of times, taught to Moses. And first we read, let's go back to 2 Corinthians, right? The first thing, the number one thing is a willing mind. That is what we need to look at. If there is first a willing mind, verse 12. Right? Okay, so this is important. There must first be a willing mind, not unwillingly give. There is a desire. There is a, you know, I want to do my part. This is very much perhaps in the woman. She did this willingly. No, she did not. Have, she's a widow. She only has so much, two mites. She don't have very much. And yet, she willingly gave. There is the first part of it, a willing mind. Okay? Now, we go on further to read. Okay? And not according to what he does not have. This is important to understand this part of it. We must actually clear misunderstandings inside us. We think that God acceptance is we must give out of faith, meaning to say, actually, we don't have it. We just Okay, I'm going to give, 
give out of what we don't have. That's not what God is asking for. It is not out of what we do not have, but actually out of what we do have. Yeah, there is something we need to clear, okay? Not according to what He does not have, okay? I, I do not mean that others should be eased and you be burdened. Now, here is another thing, misunderstanding. It is not to burden us to ease others. Right? Because we you think, okay, giving, but it is to... Now I feel so burdened, and then they, they have now an easier life. Why can't they just go to work? Why can't they do this? Why can't they do that? Why can't why they, they are just gonna live on handouts? Now, this is not what it is all about. That's gotta be cleared up. Okay? In our mind, actually, we can have a lot of mis, mis, misconceptions about giving. And hence, these things sort of stops us, prevents us from giving. One, we feel that why should we be burdened and uh, other people ease? Now, this was the Corinthians, right? And another could be, how can I give? I really feel I, I don't have this. Does God expect me to give what I don't have? Right? The answer is no. Now, these, and there could be others, but just to deal, Paul dealt with two of them. Whatever misconception they must actually be addressed and brought up, right? So, what is the right thing? What is the right perspective? A willing mind. You give because you really want to do this, willingly, freely, okay? And that would be accepted. Now, verse 14, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may supply their lack. Now, Paul knows them. They are not financially poor people. Remember, this is specific, okay? This is context. They are not the women with two might. Actually, they have. Problem is they're inside them. They unwilling to give unwilling to part. Uh, perhaps they were uh, misunderstanding. Perhaps they were just they're unable to do it. Whatever reason they were. But that's where they are. This is the Corinthians. Okay? So this is why Paul brought up and, and, and taught them what he did, advised them what he did. And so he says, it is not to ease out, but equality. That you, when in, you who have, you can help those who don't, that are really suffering lack at this point in time. That's what he is really talking about. Okay? You may supply their lack, that their abundance also may supply your lack. One day, maybe they will... Somebody, when you are in lack, you are cared for. Right? It is the same way. And God, and, and sorry, Paul sees this as how God works. And, and he cites, actually, he, he cites the scriptures with reference to Moses when God, remember, God provided manna. Right? And, and taught them and said to them, commanded them, okay, go and uh, gather what you have, what for enough for the day. And then next day you gather, and God will provide day by day. That was uh, how they survived 40 years in the wilderness. And then this is actually taken from that. He who gathered much had nothing left over. And then he who gathered little had no lack. Right? 
whether you had a lot or very little, but the key thing is, at the end of the day, you, you didn't die of starvation. Right? At the end of life, how much do we want in our bank account? How much? Whether you have a million dollars or a thousand dollars or one dollar, you can't take that with you. At all. At the end of it all, in this life, right, okay, do, will we, the, the fear is there of, wow, well, uh, you know, at, at the end, I, I don't want to have nothing left. So we don't have anything left. You know, who's going to look, at, look after me when I'm old? My rainy days. Who will provide for me? Who will, the fear of it all makes us just collect. Now, this was cited. If we go to the Old Testament text, this was the very thing that Israel failed to learn. God told them, Take what you need. Don't overtake. They didn't listen. They didn't. They hoard. Just like panic buying. Right? What does the people say? Take what you need. And they will fill the whole thing with toilet paper, with pasta, with... See, this is almost like a human thing. We, you, you, we have enough. We ha no matter how much time you say, it doesn't just happen in Australia. It happens in Singapore. It happens in America. It happens everywhere. It's a painful thing to see. Take what you need. The fear that there is not enough just makes you hoard. And Israel did that. They went out and took as much as they could and the next day, it was rotten. They disregard what God said to them. Take what you need. You will not be in lack. Would you learn this? And it's not an easy thing to learn. It isn't an easy thing to learn. Can we look at this? How would... Let's, let's go back to what is God seeking to teach in all this? Acceptance, meaning this is the right way to go. Now, right? Now, let's take a look at the first. First, there must be a willing mind. Meaning, you've given some thought to this. Right? You see, when there is abundance, you don't think about it. Okay, how, how much? What is it to Elon Musk? if he was to give 10 million. Actually, not much. Yeah, okay, go ahead. This guy is worth billions. But to a person who doesn't have that and does, you know, you've got to think through this. I want to do it, but how do I do this? How do I do this meaningfully? How do I do this? Because I, I want really willingly. See, there is thought put into this. That's why a willing mind. You've thought through this. And even as you've thought through it, you want to do this very much. Right? Now, when there is planning of giving from what we do have, we often feel we don't have we don't have this, we don't have, we don't have, we don't have. And then Paul, no, it's not what you, you do have. He tells the Corinthians, you do have. I don't have. We like to think we don't have, but actually we do. Yeah, right? And so it is, but planning needs to be there. Is God in our planning? Is giving part of our planning? As planned, as much as anything, we plan for education, we plan for pay the bills, 
we plan for holidays even, but when it comes to giving, we don't plan. We give what's left over. Right? Now, planning would tell you this comes under mind. Why willing mind? The woman who gave two mites, did she plan this? Now, it's not mentioned. Perhaps. Now, not mentioned, but this is now taught very carefully. Willing mind. Now, there is, what else? When there is really, above all, the heart that is willing to do this because you really care. Right? And so this is what he says, that you may supply, out of your abundance, you may supply their lack. There is compassion, there is empathy that is there. And these things can be missing. We just look at it and we just don't, we don't care. And that's painful. Now, well, one of you know, the people we know that really, to me, really has a, a wonderful heart of compassion is uh, this couple called John and Bev who, who comes and you know, she, they worship with us. Now, the latest thing is they, they have just gone back to the streets to go and once again feed people who are down and out. They're doing this all over again. I just say, really? Is it not... You both had a stroke. You both recovered from this. And now that you found a bit more strength, and, and they were a few weeks, you know, literally a month ago, t telling me about retiring, about stepping down, about letting the younger people take over. They just cannot help themselves. So they are back in Wednesday, back on Friday. They say, oh, we saw a group of people lining up in the hospital, in the clinic. They were cold. They didn't have food. And so Bev said to herself, you know what? I'm going to do it. <laughs> there she goes again. I said, who's cooking? She said, I am. I said, you are? <laughs> How are you doing this at home? Ah, I just take a deep breath in and really? <laughs> if I can offer a cup of soup, I will. So she'll prepare soup and then chew as many as she can all over. She said, I'm going to do it all over again. So it's, it's, it's not to her. She, this is really a willing mind. Nobody can stop her. This is a heart that really cares for those who don't have. Really, literally, nobody can stop this couple. And certainly, I'm not going to say, you've got to look out for your health, you know. You've got to look out for catching a chill. There's nothing stopping this these two. And I'm just honestly stunned. This is, this is the message in their own life. I really have this heart. So it's not all the time money. Okay, it's about giving more. It's not about the amount. It's not about, it, it, it comes in a form of money to help. It can come in form of in kind. I mean, how much money do they have? They literally use their own funds, whatever funds that they actually have, and whatever funds people give to them. Even if they don't, they're still doing it. There is no business plan. There is no uh, whatever profit loss. I, I literally ask them, so how much, how much is it, uh, say, one week? one night that you, you know, the soup and, and all that. That's unfortunately me. I have to work it out. And then she said, I don't know. Huh? You don't know? She said, yeah, I don't know. I just cook and I bring there and I feed. And I'm so happy to see them happy. <sighs> I'm, I'm taking a leaf out of that. <laughs> to learn. That is and I see these two couples with so much. They've got their own illness. They've got their own struggles. They've got 
But I see two very happy people. They may not have millions in their bank account. It's like the Macedonians. They gave out of the riches, the liberality of their heart and spirit, and they are the, truly the richer. Do they have aches and pains? <laughs> Do they need to go to medical appointments? Do they... Oh, but that is not their... You, know, you sit down with them, that's not what they talk about. They're just happy to tell me that you know, it is so wonderful to see people that are lack and they feel loved, they feel cared for, they are... See, there were other people doing this. And she looked at what they were receiving. You know why she began again? It's not because nobody else was doing it. She looked at what people were giving. They were giving cold meals in winter. Cold meals in winter. Where is the next micro oven to heat up? And she saw this person just open it up in the hunger, just took and put in the mouth without heating it. And she said, I can't let this happen. So she literally took it upon herself to go and prepare hot soup or hot anything warm and bring it to them and, you know what, have enjoyed this Wednesday and Friday. And I'm just, wow. You, can you think of sustaining? She's not thinking about sustaining. She's thinking, as long as I can do it, I'm going to do it. I think that is a wonderful way. A wonderful. It is, is this correct? This is exactly what Jesus taught. This is exactly what Paul is saying. He has to be careful because there, later on you will see this. There will be people who could accuse him for all kinds of things. But he still has to teach it. It's so sensitive, as it were. The moment he teach about giving, people may be mistaken. See, he is now trying to press funds. He's trying to raise funds. Whatever people will say, they will say. But he is still going to teach it. Carefully, correctly, biblically, still address questions that could come up or may, be, uh, may come up. And that's how Paul did it. But above all, see, that's the heart that really, really cares with faith, with love, with joy, with willingness, that is giving. So even as I read and study this, and uh, again, afresh, and you look at people like John and Bev, and see, they, they, the Corinthians had the Macedonians, but we have real life people too. They do not go around soliciting funds. They do not go around promoting. There are no flyers. There are no push-up challenges. There are nothing but just pure, you know what? I'm going to do it. Somebody is in need. I'm going to do it out of their pot. They don't have much, and they do this. The last Christmas where we talk about the pandemic and, and all that and um, the two couple had a stroke, one after another, literally. So when John had a stroke, Bev looked after. And then shortly, John recovered, Bev had a stroke, and was the other way around. It was really, really tough. And so the couple shared with me, their greatest concern is, who's going to care for those people who are outside? Because we can't. We can't go out there now. Who's going to deliver the parcel? Who's going to... So we said to them, okay, well, let Bethel do their part. Remember, we said, well, we're going to give some of these parcels and arrange with a food bank to deliver them. To deliver them. And she said, you know, that was one part, but God <laughs> did something amazing. People just came together and organized it, and it was a Christmas that even more was done with both of us stuck at home. 
But what is, how do we see all this? Well, remember this. God is specially involved. He will be involved. This is his acceptance. It will thrill your heart, your mind, your no, whatever you can. You will see this multiplied. <laughs> feeding of 5,000. So I said to them, this is your feeding of 5,000 experience. This, the Lord still does do miracles, doesn't he? Oh, absolutely. In very special ways too, if we can see this. And our challenge is to learn from the Apostle Paul, from the lives that we have come across like them, and, and, and others along the way, and be encouraged. Can we have such wonderful, meaningful faith experience? And all too soon, it's over. Life is over. It's not how much good that we have done, so it is all, uh, you know, God took account of it and remember us. It's not that. It really isn't. It's because we are God's children already. And as we are here, well, we want to do as much good as we can, as the Lord enables as the Lord in, 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 you know, provides, as the Lord bless. For those, that would be a wonderful lesson to learn to practice all the days of our life. This was very much in Andikah. Uh, hopefully, we will be able to have funeral uh, service this week because the, the hospital has finally released the body. Uh, after the report is done and, and all that. But it's really taking quite a long time in the funeral director mm. part of it. And um, you know, one of the reasons is because we are still in a pandemic. All uh, things done in funeral is actually halved. Yeah. They can only take a number of people one day in, in cemetery. And so there is a real backlog. So it's, it's, it's really quite challenging. It's, it's not like last time we can almost have a funeral readily. Uh, this is what I, I know. It's just taking such a long time, but we've got to be patient. But in the time that given, you know, I just look at and, and review Adi Kaf's life and remembering her, uh, she really, see, what did she use? Whatever funds she had to really care for people. You know, individually, you know, whatever it was, all her life. And to me, that is a really special thing. You end life with a lot, not much. How do you end life really meaningfully that you have touched many, many hearts and many, many lives. Now that is wonderful, right? Well, may we be encouraged and may we be also challenged to learn this, cultivate this for ourselves. A heart that is giving, a heart that would really be practice what Jesus said. This is what Paul recalls. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Well, let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the examples that we read in the Scriptures. The Macedonians, Paul himself, and above all, the Lord Jesus Christ. In his own life, in his teachings. And we also thank you for real-life examples that are brought into our lives, that we may see this for ourselves. That the challenge is for us to be able to cultivate the same spirit of heart and spirit, a heart that would fulfill what Jesus says, more blessed to give than to receive. May we have this blessing in our life too. We pray in Jesus' name.